It's a little different with you have to, nine of us, I think. Yeah. See if they all, hope, yeah. you know, usually they all agree, and that makes my life easier. Right. When I don't, I have to. But we have to yell at them. Okay, so we'll look it over it. to Patty. Okay, so um, you have eight warrants to sign tonight, totaling 47607 and 83 cents. I sent you your report on Friday, and tonight at your place I handed out some um, some budget issues that have come up i've done a summary um and i'll point them out where they are on the report so the first one is um after the budget season after the budget was completed uh we had a number of students that were coming into the school that had ell issues so we had to increase our uh teacher a point two which cost us an additional thirteen thousand four hundred and thirty two dollars out of school choice and if you look on page five of your report, the first line says it's, it's uh, over 13309.10. Um, so we got, I got a little bit of a rounding issue. I went by this, the total salary, so it's off a few bucks there. Um, but if we want to stay on this page, um, the other thing that changed after the budget was approved was um, Mr. Cristofoli felt that he needed a, an additional SPED teacher. So he had two IA vacancies, which he did not fill, and used that money to fill a SPED teacher position. Um, and the difference of that was an additional $673 from the budget. And that is also on page five, line two. You can see the 673 is right there. Uh, and then lastly, which will show up on this page next month when I run the new report, we had a student that, um, after the budget process, was placed in an out-of-district placement in one of our other elementary schools. So we have to pay tuition. Now this student is a school choice student, so um, my, my, um, my proposal to you is we had, um, we got an unexpected amount of money in circuit breaker, $16,816 because one of our Waitley students whose school choice is out to another district is in another district placement, but we get the circuit breaker money, so we weren't expecting that. So my proposal to you is to pay for this unexpected tuition to use the 16816 from circuit breaker and the balance from the school choice of 11569.12. Now, um, can, can I just ask you a question? Sure. Is that, that's a Waitley student that's going there, or it's... It's a Whaley it was a it's a Whaley student, but it's a, one of our school choice students that was here. So we still are responsible for them, but we will get the money back when we fill out our sped increments at the end of the year. Okay. We'll get the money, we get the money, we'll money back. back next yes, year. in school choice next year. Next year. Yeah. Well, at the end of this year. Yeah. Okay. For next, school choice, is it, for, ne for next year. Is it school choice or is it circuit breaker money? Yeah, the, the okay. Money so it's two. We have two different things. Okay. It's two different things. We have a student here who was a school choice student who couldn't remain getting service here right. and was placed. Right. So we're responsible for that tuition, but we will get it back from school choice. Secondly, we got money from Circuit Breaker because a Whaley resident who attends, whose school choice is out to another public school, then was put in an out of district placement. So they, the, the town had to pay for that. We get circuit breaker because they broke the circuit breaker, so we get sixteen thousand dollars in circuit breaker money. But we didn't apply for the money; the other district did, who put the kid in the out of district placement. But we get the money but do because we have to pay that town. The town, the town of Waitley pays them. So are they going to let us keep the sixteen thousand? They have no choice. It's it, it has to be used for special for special education, education. in Waitley. In Waitley. So that's why I'm saying we might as well use it to pay the tuition. 
um, because we, we also, um, I was informed um, Friday, we may have another student that might be going into another out of district placement. So, so that'll be another. Is there a difference between in district placement and out of district placement? Well, it, it, these cost? kids are staying in the, in, in our, our in our four towns. Yeah. But we still have to pay that school that they're going their tuition out of district rate. So it's Those cheaper. Higher. It's if they're going to a public school in a special program. So it's cheaper than if we sent them to a a, a seven sixty six private right. placement. But it's higher than if they just move school choice. <coughs> right. So we get the money back because the school choice we only get five thousand, but then we get the sped increment. Mm -hmm. um, and so and then on uh, the general fund budget. Um, our new PE teacher, we saved $569, and you can find that um, savings on page two of this report. And in the second grouping down, um, it says physical education teacher, and you can see it says 568.55 in the far right column. And then the only other thing that I see an issue with is that we have to pay for the transportation for that child to attend that other school. We only budgeted 1800 so right now it looks like we're gonna have a shortfall about 4300 but we'll get that money back. But I wanna use up the budget money we have and also any savings we'll have from the fuel adjustment clause. So I'm leaving it on the general fund right now. What happens next year when the student is, like if we're thinking about budget, so this is this year. Right. right? We'll budget it's it out of school choice, choice again. Into Whaley, yes. And then gets placed. Depends on where, what grade they're in. Uh -huh. I, I believe they'll both be the here two more years. Out now, yeah. The student who's out now is a sixth grader, so okay. they'll be going so they, somewhere else next year. Okay. Either frontier's responsibility or somebody else's. So our budget doesn't have to bear the cost mm -hmm. of this. Everybody can try to be confidential mm -hmm. at grade level. I mm -hmm. probably shouldn't have, sorry. <clears throat> well, so we want to keep that in mind as we're budgeting. Cool. Well, but we'll probably budget it out of school choice if they're school choice kids. Hmm? We'll use school choice funds if they're school choice kids. But we'll get the money again. More but it's more than you get for a school choice. No, we get exactly, for a sped kid, we get exactly what we spent. Oh, okay. Yeah, the 5000 plus. plus so 5000 5, plus the sped increment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So th we get this back, this eliminates. Yes. Yeah, the COVID. The town, the town will pay. Their town, where the child comes from, will pay. Okay. So, so then, why is it a budget variance? I guess I not because I didn't budget it in school choice this year. Okay. I didn't know about it. We did not know when the time when we did our budget. So if you look at page so five, that money back. Right. we will, not but until that's not until not not till June, and it's there's a delay. Yeah, we correct. Have to use okay. our own money until they reimburse us in the spring. We're spending a year in arrears. Remember. Mm -hmm. So when we look at page five, which is our school choice budget, there is no tuition budgeted. So you're gonna see a budget variance because it's gonna show up next month because the, uh, when I run this for the encumbrance mm -hmm. report for December, it'll pop up. Right. So the piece we're missing here is the balance in this account of how much money is in here. Is that on here? Okay. This is what we budgeted, 316,433. Right. right now, we're gonna overspend that by 12. When I run this report, it'll be 12 plus 11 next, year, next month. Okay. So we're, I, I'm letting you know that our budget for school choice is being overspent. But the money will come back to us for us to use this either this year to make the, up this shortfall or when we're planning for FY19. So we can count on even though right now it's not there, we can count Correct. on doing that. It's like you're using our money but not paying interest. Not that we get interest. Right, so we can fill them directly. But it's quite a awesome. But the other bigger picture is that we're sp spending our school choice money up now. now in the current, which is the issue that we were always talking about before, which is we used to have a big balance in this account that we could kind of carry over. We always carried, we always had a little extra money for a rainy day just in, in case something happened. In the school choice. And now that we're basically spending how much we get in every year, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't come in, you're saying, until the end of the year? Right. Because they didn't know, they didn't know, they won't know until we do our SPED increment forms in May that we do, that we're incurring these costs. Mm -hmm. Top 
their town will be a little shocked when they get the bill from us. Yes, we're of this chat for that. Yes. It's very hard to budget those things. <laughs> okay. Well, things change. You know, we do right, budget so I mean, early. Change, and then, right. you know, we still have five months of school to go. And yeah, we never change. know. We never know when even one of our own kids, somebody new moves into town. Mm -hmm. We never know right, until, sure the until they show up. Basically, Pete knows who they are, but you know, we don't know what kind of extra help they may need or something. So. Well, that's the thirteen thousand so, dollars. Right. That's the big SLT. increase. Sure. Are we going to need that going forward, do we think, or do we know, or like, is that something that's going to carry on? So my understanding is that ELL kids um, sort of level up as they get the services they need, and at some point mm -hmm. they level out of direct services. Okay. Um, so we would anticipate that, you know, and I think that the way it works in ELL, Louise knows more about this than I do, but level one, level two, level three, I think it goes up to level four, okay. maybe five, five levels. Mm -hmm. with. Five being the most independent with language, and ones and twos might need some support. Uh -huh. uh, and when that support diminishes, so do the services, so will the attached funds. And these are things we can reduce and increase easily with staff. Well, the, the part that, that I mean, you know, I think the part that's the hardest is that we have somebody employed doing that right. work. So when they, we no longer need, need that work, that person loses. They lose those hours. Yeah, loses okay. that, that time, but. Okay. If that's what you mean by hard, that's always hard for an employee. Yeah. But, but yes, as the services go away, then that's what we have to naturally do is you know, remove the provider. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I just didn't know if you wanted to do um, further down on the agenda is the yeah. uh, budget calendar. I don't know if you want to take that out of order and address it while I'm here. That would be great. Okay. okay. Lynn, did you want to take this, or do you want me to do it? Or? Um, do we have to vote on it? No. Oh, we don't. Okay. Because I put it on Frontier that we're voting on it. Yeah. Would you present it? It's sure. It's the same thing as last year, mm -hmm. except that it's dead it day off. So it's just our timeline. So okay. this week. Um, we will be, uh, Dr. Carey is having a meeting with the principals and all the administrators uh, to do what our, our budget kickoff and our process is, and uh, this didn't get corrected, it's supposed to say FY19 budget, not an FY18. Um, she did send out another one. Oh, she did? Yeah, okay. She did. All right. Um, so we'll be doing our kickoff meeting um, Wednesday. And then um, during next, the following week, Dr. Carey and myself and the other administrators will be meeting with each principal individually to go through their budgets. Um, and we will then be drafting all the data and looking at the changes and projecting the salaries. That'll happen till the la probably the last week of, of December. Uh, and then we will be bringing it to you for your first budget deliberation on January 8th. Uh, the meeting is postponed a week because the first Monday is January 1st. Um, and then January the, in February, we'll continue the deliberations. And uh, for the, sometime February, March, possibly even earlier from what we're hearing, um, we will be probably called to the town offices um, to present our budget. Uh, and then your public meeting will be on March 5th, and you will vote the budget at the close of the public hearing. Uh, our town meeting is scheduled for April 24th, and I don't, did your, I don't know the date of your town election. I don't know if it's a week, the Saturday following, or is it a, two, oh, a week and a Saturday? It's always a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. It's right around that same time. So it's probably a, a week from April 24th. It's in April. Or May. Yeah, it's probably the first Tuesday of May. So the first three meetings, is that us? Yes, that'll be you looking at the budget and deliberating. And I'll also send copies to the town because they want to know. Right. right. So like when you guys look at it on a Monday night, Tuesday morning, I'll ship it to Brian Domina um, so that he can share it with his groups, his finance committees, his select board. Can you walk us through that again? So you're going to, what are you going to send to us? Uh, whatever I present to you on that Monday night, mm -hmm. this January 8th, okay. I'll send to them January 9th. So that you see it first. Okay. Or your husband can actually see it when you go home on Monday night if you want to show it to him. Um, okay. So we have a chance, though, to have we it have, we have before one. you send it to the town. Well, if you want me to hold it. Once I present it here, it's a public document, so. Okay. Well, we They've been wanting information earlier and earlier, so I don't know. 
Yeah. And do we meet on December 29th? No, that's just the, the week that we're, we're finalizing all the documents and yeah. everything. So, and we've got five budgets to do. It's not just Wheatley. So we're working on five budgets at the same time. Are we sending it to the select bin, the select board, or the finance committee? No, we just send it to Brian. Yeah, Brian will. Yeah. Brian will. Disseminate know, it. Make some copies. Here you go. They always complain that we never give it to them enough of time to look at it. Blah, blah, blah. I don't imagine they would well, want us even before yeah. I mean, public they, meeting or presented to the finance committee. They may want us to come in, who knows, in January. I mean, after the September right. September meeting we had with them. Well, I think they're interested also in learn, hearing more about the drivers, not just the numbers, but like what is it that's driving our budget. So I guess I would like in our first meeting to talk a little bit about enrollment um, and Staffing is obviously a big driver. Um, I hope to have PowerPoints prepared for each of the towns by then. Some of that with that some of would that data. Explain, yeah, that yeah. would show the data, um, not only in numbers but in infographics. So but we do. Data. But we have Katie. We always have staff data. We add. We, we added that sheet that Dr. Right. Karen. Yeah, I'm not saying you don't have it, but I'm just saying that to me would be the time to talk about right. it. Right. But that's ourselves. part of the budget package. We put that page yeah. with all the enrollment and all the staffing on it. But you don't have the history, do you? Do you have like no. year over year? No. Because I think what well, we, we do from last year to this year, to, from FYE right. to just two years. Yeah, that could just two years. But it would be nice to have historical, a little more like five years or something. And it would just be nice if I had five people in my office to gather all that data. Okay. But <laughs> we are going to do our best to um, to be more uh, explicit. We're, we, the the the. Documents that Patty presents are incredibly transparent, mm -hmm. but it's very hard. I was looking at stuff today uh, with some, with a school committee member, and you have to dig through. It's all there, but if we can pull out the main points, right? Not the not the little itty bitty details, how many pencils and you know no. how many p pieces of paper, but these are this is really what we're spending it on, and this mm -hmm. is what we're looking at, mm -hmm. and. Um, to give a real clear picture, and that's that's what we're going to try for. It's, yeah. it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, and I'm not saying we'll get it all right this year, but no. once you get the history in place, then it's a matter of adding the new year right. every year. Right. What, is, what is every line item in a in a group of three items or ten items, and you have a, a pot of money to thirty thousand dollars or whatever it is? What do we take out of that thirty thousand dollars historically every year? Are we? Uh, do we have too much money there, or do we have not enough, not, not enough money in that thirty thousand to cover everything in that in that particular space? Right. I mean, that's well. That's one thing to look at. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, how many students are there coming in here, and the, what's the population, and how is that driving Certainly. our budget needs, and maybe a little bit about the makeup of those students to the extent that that drives some of the costs. I don't know how much we. Again, I'm not expecting we'll have this all right now, but. That would be the We're kinds of try, trends yeah. that would be helpful to We're identify. We're going to try hard, and, and, and Patty, again, she's like Bob Cratchit. I mean, she's just working on those numbers all the time. Yeah. And so I'm not trying to create more work. No, I'm going to try from my side, you know, uh, and part of my goals is to illustrate more mm -hmm. and to talk more um, knowledgeably Instead of all the little, you know, minute details, this is this is it. This is what we're paying right. for, and this is what the people are seeing. And so it's important to uh, to break it up. But the pie is not broken up into how many line items you have. It's broken up into staff. And, and when I first came, came, it was very. Right. It, it, was, it, was it went way. from it went from this is the number. And you're going to vote it. So I gave you, and everyone yeah. said that wasn't transparent. So we, we blew it up. And now everyone's saying, well, that's too much detail. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're trying to right size every year. Right. Yeah. And, uh, but we'll get it. We'll get it going and we'll get it right. And we're always open for feedback. So okay. we'll give it an honest effort. And I'm hoping that it'll be interesting and entertaining, but mm -hmm. also that we'll all. Oh, it's well, always helpful. it's like always entertaining. It's always well, entertaining. It's always entertaining. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just have Louise take care of it for me because she's so good at everything. <laughs> she can take care of that too. Yeah, Patty doesn't do PowerPoint. She only does Excel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the capital budget, I I got myself on the committee, <laughs> which 
is meeting January the town the town uh, capital committee is meeting on January the next week January like 12th or okay. something yeah but all, everything is due by January 5th so yeah. to the extent we have any new items I have the list of existing items so I, think, I can share that with oh, everybody. I guess with what's going on with the sprinkler, right, I, think, I, I, don't, I really we don't. We might think not have any new items to add, but I just want to ask the question. Probably not. Yes, we do. But, but we do have we do have a a one to three, a three to five, right. a five to seven, a seven to ten year mm -hmm. window window of what we need and know some of those things and some of the things maybe even now, but until we find out more with. And I know we're probably going to talk about it later about the spring clear. I don't mm -hmm. um, think we really can um, get our hopes about anything else. We got no, a couple okay. things being done in, now and in, in the future with the new intercom system and phone system. So, and, right, and when we get into that portion of we the meeting, I can that talk about okay. that because I have it. I don't even know where is that closet anyway. Over, Over here. here. Right, here. Right, right, these double doors. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Because we did talk last week, and I did put the wheels in motion. Anything else for Patty, guys? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, night Patty. Right. We'll see you next year. <laughs> yes. Merry Christmas. Next Merry year. Christmas. Happy holidays. <laughs> so we have no public comments, I don't think. No. <laughs> I'm wondering. What if, how about if we do we Louise first? Yes, yes. Of yes. she can let her go home. Yeah. 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 Right. She'll be happy. That's so fine. I'm fine with you. She's joined and she's entering the same world. thing. From, yeah. But I, uh, you know, you have to, I yeah. just think about these people. They work all day and then they're here. I mean, my, that's me, but I'd like to make That's fine. So we'll Thank switch you, over to new business to before we right. This, I, I did this right. I'm going to cross the board. Yeah, she'll be upset. Okay. Well, um, when this comes up, okay. I thought it would be useful as the policymakers for you to understand some of the shifts that are happening at the state level with MCAS, and then we'll zoom in a little bit and see how Waitley kids did, and um, what our plans are. And um, so I thought I would share a little bit of the information that the state has put out that um, is meant to be parent friendly. And so we'll start with that. What what is um, happening in the state of Massachusetts. Well, the good news is we're in a very high achieving state, and that remains. We're still, and have been for many years, number one in the nation in reading and math on the NEEPS, which is um, a national assessment where um, this organization comes in, I think it's every other year, and randomly tests students in fourth grade, eighth grade, and tenth grade throughout the nation and they've come into some of our schools. They came into Frontier, they came into Deerfield, they came into Sunderland, and they just say, give us um, your whole list of all your fourth graders, we're gonna randomly pick so that you don't give them your best students necessarily. <laughs> and so, based on this national assessment, Massachusetts is first in the nation in math and reading. Um, it, we have the highest ACT scores, that's at the high school level in the nation, the highest AP scores, and number one in the world, um, I just heard this actually recently, um, that PISA, which is an international assessment, if you took Massachusetts out of the United States and treated it as a nation, we would be number one. So, we're doing pretty well here in Massachusetts. It's a confluence of some of the demographics of Massachusetts. We have the second highest um, educational level in the country in Massachusetts among the adults and we're third in terms of income. So when you cross those, that is um, a good demographic, but also our schools are um, following the most rigorous standards. And even since the Common Core, Massachusetts has even taken the Common Core and upped some of the ante and made some of the standards more rigorous. Um, so what's new with MCAS? As you know, MCAS um, started in 1993, and here's some of the, um, they have this in pictures, let's see what we got here. Um, it's been upgraded because it started 20 years ago, actually 1993, 20, what, two, 23 years ago. And um, it didn't change a lot until recently, it didn't change substantively. And what has changed is 
there's more, um, more critical thinking. Even though there's multiple choice, kids are being asked to compare and contrast from very young different pieces of literature to write about them from um, even beginning in third grade. And it is now computer-based. This past year, it was only mandatory in grades four, eight, and not 10, four and eight in the state to take these tests by computer. We chose in our district to have all of our kids do it because we wanted them to have more experience. And we were offered uh, districts that would ask that all of their students to do it were offered a what called safe harbor. In other words, if our kids didn't do well, there were no consequences. So we thought this is a great opportunity for our teachers to see, work out the glitches, and for our kids to get comfortable before it counted. Well, the good news is our kids did really well, and I'm going to share the data there. They took them on Chromebooks in their classrooms. So because we've, um, in this district and in Wait in particular, you funded um, access for kids to have the access to Chromebooks, they were comfortable with it. We didn't know how third graders, eight-year-olds, would do taking a digital test. We were very pleased and surprised. They did some practicing, but um, they did very well. So we chose to do it for every classroom. So this year, our fourth graders will have the advantage that it's not their first time ever taking a test on a computer, it's their second time. Mm -hmm. And by the time they get to, when it really counts in 10th grade, it'll be their you know, seventh time, so, um, or sixth time. So um, what, what the state says is MCAS helps the Commonwealth identify schools that need additional support. Um, and we're not one of them right now, and that means with a high failure rate, and it's no longer called failure, but they look at those test scores, and. You can probably imagine that schools that serve um, higher poverty uh, populations, more transient populations, and populations with higher amount of English language learners, if you're hungry, <laughs> you don't speak English as your native language, and you just moved to town, you're probably not going to do as well on a test as a child in a comfortable community like, like Waitley and very um, consistent background. So, what has happened is the higher poverty schools have um, gotten um, not done as well on the tests. And it's not the teacher's fault, it's the, um, the population they're serving that has other stresses. Um, Waitley, the students do well, and we're, we're quite pleased with it, so I'll, I'll get to that soon. These next generation MCAS um, shows a little bit more information, and I'm going to show you a parent report, than what we used to get. What you used to get is your child scored proficient, needs improvement, warning, which is the lowest, or advanced. Um, now there's, they've broken down the information, and there's a lot more. In fact, it might be even a little overwhelming for some families because it's a, a, a very detailed report. Um, they're trying to communicate where the strengths and where the work needs to be done. They've changed the language. So it's no longer, and, and I, I like this better, it's no longer warning, which is kind of a dire label to say. I mean warning. It's not meeting the expectations. Okay. Sounds better. Yeah. Instead of needs improvement, which also sounds um, kind of alarming, it's you're partially meeting expectations. Then when you meet the expectations, and then exceeding the expectations. So this is actually what we call more growth mindset language. It's more encouraging, and it's more descriptive. Warning, like who, who's warning? You know, that was kind of a, a label that was an opinion. We're warning you versus you're not quite meeting our expectations or you're almost there. So these are the new, um, the new categories. And frankly, most of the state didn't quite get to the, they've raised the bar, so meeting expectations, the expectations are higher. And um, in every uh, grade level, they've tried to calibrate the test. This was our first baseline year in the state, so only about half the kids met expectations. They intentionally calibrated it that way so that it's a baseline year for these new tests. So it's was very in, rigorous. In the state you said only half? met expectations in the yes. state? Is that yeah. lower than the past? 
a little bit lower, yeah. Usually it's about 60 some, 63% for reading and about 57% for uh, math is about average. So they've calibrated it. And in fact, they talk about the, um, historically what one of the problems with the test was, it was not what we call internally calibrated. It was harder to get to proficient as a fourth grader. Fewer kids got there than as a fifth grader. And it was harder as a sixth grader than a seventh grader. And it was harder in math than English. That's called, a, that's not an internally calibrated test. It should be about equally difficult across the board. So what you found is a student might score proficient as a third grader and then needs improvement as a fourth grader even though they're at the same national percentile with their skills. So they've worked on that and have internal, and that's why this is the baseline year. They took all of the tests and they made it a 50% cut. Um, so the parent guardian report. Um, there's a lot of information on these reports. It's how did the student do? It's um, how the student did compared to the school, district, and state. And in our Union 38, our school is our district. Mm -hmm. So that can be confusing to families. They get, here's how your school did, here's how your district. Wow, we're right, we did just the same as the district. Because it is, Waitley is its own district in this, in this um, case. So that can be a little confusing. Um, and you'll be able to see how your uh, child did in each category. So what does that look like? Well, this is what um, parents will get, and some of you might have already gotten these. <laughs> and it shows the range, the new cutoff. It used to be that to be proficient, um, the cutoff was a score of 240. Well, they've changed all of that, which confused all of us, because the new number is 500. So, 500 is the cutoff um, to make meets expectations. And you'd get three scores if your, students in, if your child's in fifth grade, they took science. But this is what it will look like, whoops. So here's a fictitious, um, oh no, they're not showing the, the actual child. So not meeting, the lowest score you can get is a 440. If you write your name, you really? get a 440. <laughs> It's like on the SATs, what was it, like a 220 or something, if you wrote your 400 or something like that. But anyway, that's the bottom. 470 is the beginning of partially meeting. So if a, a student who scores under 470 hasn't met the expectations. These are students that in, in our district, we'd want to make sure they were getting some kind of support, or maybe they had a really off day, but we'd really look carefully at what happened here. Partially meeting is where most kids are going to score on this first go round in the whole state. Meeting is starts at 500 and then exceeding over um, 530 to 560 is a perfect score. This would get into out of, out of grade level expectations. So the test to meet expectations, it's about getting half of them right. So if you think about it, when we were kids, if you've got a 50 on a test, you wouldn't be meeting expectations. That shows the rigor of the test. It goes outside of the grade level band of expectations. Um, and that's what exceeding is. So student, uh, people will see how their child did, how their child did compared to the school, the district, and the state. Um, um, can I ask you a yeah, question? Sure. So to meet expectations, they only need to get 50% correct? For this first go round, that's about how many, because the, the rigor of the test is such that well, my, about, I have not taken it yet, but, oh, okay. but if, if they're taking a test, they would get a sense if they were, if they were getting things correct or not, and if they felt like they were getting at least half of them wrong. Yeah, it can be discouraging. Very discouraging. So we have to um, prepare kids for that, and we, we tell them, there's going to be a lot of questions on here that are for much older kids. Just do Why your best. We try to they design it that way. I don't understand that. <laughs> These are things we've been talking about for well, a long time. Th it's they're, very complex. Um, those who are <clears throat> not as optimistic might say it's about really charter schools and proving how public schools fail. I, I wouldn't say that. 
always. <laughs> but um, there, there is a political agenda with some of these tests, and it's not a, always in the best interest of children. It just sounds like it's not designed for the grade level that they're giving it. They're quite rigorous. And I'm going to show you some of the questions of what our, our children had to do. Um, it's, they, they are rigorous. I'm, I'm neither um, supporting nor not supporting them. I think there is a, a place for standardized testing in a, in a school. These were uh, MCAS back in 1993, um, were originally designed to hold schools accountable, not children. So the, we didn't used to get individual scores. We just got, here's how your school did. Well, in your imagination, how do you think the average 16-year-old, when they knew nobody was going to know how they did, <laughs> it didn't count, how, much, how, much, um, how invested do you think they were? So the state quickly realized if, you te if kids and teachers and everybody knows no child or family is ever going to see this score, they're not going to be quite valid because older kids will check out. You know, why do I have to do this? So then they started giving individual scores. It was always designed to hold schools accountable, not children. And the important thing for all of us to keep in mind is there is no consequence until you reach 10th grade. So a fourth grader who maybe is in not meeting expectations, we're not going to retain them in the grade. We're going to make sure they get what they need. So there's no consequence except to schools that consistently score low. Those schools are at risk of um, losing funding, being taken over by the state, or being turned into charter schools. So that's what's happening in some of the high poverty areas, like the town of, like the city of Holyoke got taken over. But think of who, who does Holyoke serve? They serve a higher poverty population. And students who, um, many don't speak English as their native language, a lot of transiency. And so their test scores aren't going to be as high. So the politics of it is a whole other aside. What we try to do is prepare students to say, this is a challenging task. You're not going to know all the answers. Do your best. What are some strategies you can use? And it's actually pretty impressive. I was in classrooms watching kids take it. And even the teacher's eyes were really big. Like, look how well they're, they're handling all of these tools and dragging and dropping. And, uh, and I'll show you some of the, the tasks. I'd also like to yeah. point out, though, that um, under Louise, uh, we also decided as a, a curriculum cabinet that the kids would take the, uh, it's called Northwest, uh, whatever, I, I call maps, measures mm -hmm. of academic progress. They took those on the computer, which they're used to, but they took them three times this year. So they took them in the last year, fall, winter, and spring. So they had that kind of experience on those tests, which are aligned to the Common Core, not nearly as rigorous as this, but they had been doing that, and they kind of used it as practice right. for the students. And I think that these, and a lot of teachers did a lot of this, uh, practicing too. They were really well prepared. The teachers worked really hard in preparing the kids. I did That's hear that third graders, I think, had to write an essay yes. on a computer. Yes. And I don't even know if they could write an essay by hand. So it's pretty yeah, they were, Well, it, it, it is. And that was extremely challenging for all eight year olds, for all third graders. And um, some of the teachers were very concerned, but the kids took it more in stride than we as adults did. They're like, yeah, OK, I'll try this. And um, you know, they weren't getting upset. But um, this is, I'll show you what it looks like. So this is an example of a, a release question, a real MCAS. And you can go online and look at these at different grade levels. I know the answer is yet? <laughs> I know the answer already. So <laughs> this is what it looks like. A child you know, will tough. get a question. You know, and so here's the, the math of it, You know, 700 and 20 students, this is a typical kind of question. They're going on a, a field trip, they, they have buses, each bus holds 60. What's the least number of buses to take? Enter your answer and your work or explanation in the space. So now you've got to do the math, and you've got to go over here, and you've got to say, OK, seven buses because, and you say, well, how do you know? Because, you know, so this is, this is what kids have to do. 7 equals um, 4, 20. No, uh-oh, I better check that. That's not right. So, you know, so they might put it in. Usually when you're doing it by, on, on paper, 
it's quick. Now I go, oh, wait a minute, that's not the right number. So there's a lot of computer skills and really focusing and paying attention. So, um, and they need to use this, okay, so really I'm going to 720. So now I've got to figure out, well, how many? So I'll say, okay, 12, right? Um, so I've got to be able to do this. And they would like them to use these, right? So they're using um, mathematical symbols. What's that little box next to the 720? Well, that's where I put the answer. Really, they don't need the 720. They know that's the answer. What they want is how many buses. But I can't just write 6 times 12 equals 720. I've got to say, you need, oh, 12 buses. Now I have to see if I made a mistake. Look at all the steps. 12 buses, because 6 times 12 equals <coughs> 720. So that's the kind of um, oops, 12 buses. Did the kids have scrap paper? Did yes, they, sort of work they do. <coughs> but yeah. look, look at what, you know, just to solve this one, mm -hmm. there's a lot of effort, even for me as a pretty comfortable computer user. Then there's always, not always, there's frequently a part. <laughs> so this is new. We didn't used to have so many part A. Now building on that, write an equation to represent the problem you solved in part A. But I just did, I thought I was explaining my answer. Hmm, what does that mean? So, they, they need to say, okay, 12 buses, and I know this because, this is what is expected, because, um, so I'm just giving you an example of, they have to explain it, and then down here, write an equation, enter only the equation. So they don't want any words now. So look at all the vocabulary the children need to know. So they're entering the equation. So here I am doing the 12 times 6. And I've got to go six, down here. Should be 60. 60. 60, I mean. 60. Yes, thank you. <laughs> See? I might not be doing so well here. I'm, I'm trying to present and take a test. Not going to do well. Right, thank you. 60. <laughs> thank you. you. See, have... now I would have gotten partial yeah. credit because I got some of it. They yeah. would get some partial credit. Okay, thank you. And now there's so a part C. We have to write so the build. equation over and over. Yeah, again. well, here I've got to explain. So I've got to say, I know it's 12 buses because I, be, well, how do you know this? Right? It used to be you could draw, but you can't draw on the computer. Like kids used to literally draw all buses, right? So now there's a part C. The school can also use smaller buses. Each of them holds 50. What's the least number of buses to take all the students to the museum? Show or explain how you got your answer. Enter your answer below. So, I mean, this is what kids are having to do. So, so we, do multiplication, then you go to division since you know what the number is, and you know how many, how, many, how many the bus holds, you can use division instead of multiplication this time. Exactly. And so this is what they're testing. What they're <coughs> testing is, do you understand number? Can you work flexibly up and then back down? Exactly what you said. That's true fluency. True fluency is not just how quickly can you solve it, but can you put it together, take it apart. Also, this isn't going to work evenly. Right. Right? So you can't have half a bus. So if you've got, if these buses hold 50, now I've got to figure that out. So now here comes the critical thinking. Mathematically, it might work out to 14 and two-fifths of a bus, but you can't have two-fifths of a bus. So 14 buses can take 50, but the bus number 15 will only take 10 or whatever. Right, so what's the least number of buses? And that's actually a real kind of problem. That's realistic, you know, you would have to solve. But Unless you want to put a few people on the roof or you something. You could. <laughs> but yeah, here, what, what I wanted I'm to not demonstrate. I'm sure if a fifth grader is going to tell yeah, they could, they, I don't know. If they said that, I only need, I wonder what would happen. I need 14 buses and I'll put 20 kids on the roof. They might get partial credit because they showed the you the math. But um, look at all the parts. So this is, mm. this is a real question wow. from, um, I believe this, was, this is fifth grade. Yeah. So, the point is, you, you can know your mathematical, you can have that mathematical understanding, but you've got to work your way through all of these steps, explain your answer, um, demonstrate, use these tools over here to do the equals, and um, make sure they go check your work. So, so whoever's the, grading these has to look at each, it's not automated. 
Some of it is, some of it is not. These will have to be read by human, though Pearson, which wasn't supposed to get the contract but did um, for this particular test, does employ digital readers, which are grossly inaccurate. So I, I do wonder, in other words, the computer will read it and look for patterns. And I'm not sure if they're doing, if they've done it yet. This go around was the baseline. I think the state was reading all the answers to say, how many kids could do this? Our kids were at an, our students were at an advantage. They knew how to use Chromebooks. Our curriculum does ask kids to ask, solve multi-step problems. <coughs> our curriculum does ask them to explain their thinking. Our curriculum does ask them to show with pictures, numbers, or words, read, write, draw. So. This wasn't um, as challenging for our students as it could be for some. They're very prepared. Nonetheless, there's a lot of steps, and if you don't hit the right buttons, like I didn't right there, I, I got distracted, I did six times 12. So here's, others are multiple choice, which are the following expressions. So there are some that you can just, I, I don't know if that's right or not. They can do some multiple choice. And so this is really the real questions that were on the fifth grade. And then this one, um, height in centimeters. So for some, this is called a, um, this is not an open response, this is called a short answer. There are three types of questions. Multiple choice, which they call, it's no longer multiple choice, it's called selected response. <laughs> There's um, open response, which is like what the, the multi-part that I just did where I had to explain, like how do I know? If I just put the numbers in there, you wouldn't get full credit. So you have to show your thinking. And then this is called short answer, where it's just a, an equation, but there's no choices. There's no select choices to select. So I've got to solve it and, and type my numbers in there. So that's an example of what our students are seeing and why they need the computer skills. They need perseverance. They need to not be distracted. They need to be able to stick with it through three multiple parts. And really, it's, it's a lot, it's, as you can see, it's a very demanding exam. Each state is making their own test. So even though the common core standards are common, Massachusetts has set a very high bar for how they're measuring what kids can do. Um, here's an example of English language arts. They need to read and scroll on the screen, um, the passage. And then, here's an example. Um, from the, this is the sixth grade, write an essay explaining how these two passages each help the reader to understand the colonist challenge of living in a cold climate. <coughs> Be sure to use information from both the article and the passage. Again, this reflects how we're teaching. So that's the good news, is we're asking kids to do a lot of compare and contrast, reading something that maybe is informational, and then something like a poem, and gleaning information from that. But they need to write, so they need what kind of skills? They need keyboarding skills. And we have um, a program called Keyboarding Without Tears, <laughs> which is actually our um, library media specialist spent a year researching all of the keyboarding programs. And this was the most child-friendly, the most aligned to um, the strategies that we use for teaching other things, and the easiest for kids to get into and practice. What did they start that? Well, this, they sort of tinkered with it last year. This year, they're starting, and actually, late second grade, we need to teach keyboarding now, because third grade, they're gonna be taking these tests. Didn't, didn't, of course, back, I didn't take it when I went to high school, but back in our days, we had typing. Right, in middle school. The, all the, well, I would say, not all the school, but most everybody, all the women used to take typing because of office jobs or something like that. Yeah, everybody needs to take totally, typing. Now, I can, take, I can take my phone now with the alphabet on it, I can almost hit it blindly because I've hit it so many right. times. It's almost like but I think it is really important for the kids. Like my daughter is very good typist now. She's taken that course, I think. But it, it gives them an advantage when they're taking the test mm -hmm. if they can type well. And just generally, also muscle memory. If you start with bad habits, mm -hmm. like right, 
um, they're really hard to break. Yeah. So we're trying to teach kids the you know the ASD FJK from very yeah from very young like so they come. don't have to undo. Like to <laughs> sit on a class. No tears though. <laughs> I know, Can I bang on it? <laughs> no. The good news is it's it's very um, child friendly. The whole way that it's introduced, it's not stressed, and the kids do little timed things themselves independently to test themselves, and so it is um, child friendly, but. It is a necessary skill now. So, um, so how did we do? How did Waitley kids do? Okay, so now you had a taste, just a taste of the test. This is the state averages in um, across Massachusetts in third grade reading. As you can see, this is not meeting. This is partially met and exceeding. Not meeting and partially 52% of the state. Meeting, 39.8. In Waitley, nobody d was in not meeting in third grade, which is great news because even to get to partially is pretty rigorous. And so it was split 50-50. Half of our kids partially met and half met. So that's how third grade reading. And this, these third graders were compared to kids who also took it in pencil, paper. So only about 60% or fewer of the state in third grade took it on the computer. So here's our kids, first time out on the computer, nobody scored not met, and they scored better than the state, wow. and compared to a lot of kids who were taking it the way they so used the to. the state includes paper takers. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, they didn't disaggregate. Hmm. So, because that was just like too much of a test. So they took everybody, threw them into that, and then told us how our kids did. So we were pretty proud of them that they did as well as they did being the first third graders to take it on a computer. And then here's math. So you can see at the state, 13, 38, 42. And you can see we did have a few kids who scored in the not math. It was a combination of the math and writing about the math. But fewer than at the state, and we had more kids high, higher in the um, meeting. meeting. And we didn't get anybody to exceeding, but again, no, they took it on the computer. So first time out, we were pretty pleased with this. Um, so Waitley is not lumped with Deerfield, Sunderland, and Conway, even though we're all Union 38. They don't own consider own us a district. Okay. We're our own districts. It's been a challenge for years. I would love to aggregate and see how we did as a district, and I can do it by hand. I can download all the numbers, but this is um, just the Waitley kids. And you know, keep in mind this is 18 children, right. so <laughs> it can vary a lot year to year because of that. Yes, yeah. it's such a small sample. Yeah, and so that's statistically under 20 isn't even considered a valid number to base any decisions on. <laughs> so yeah, you know, we've, we're up against that. You know, certainly we track it, but so that number 11 that you see is two. one kid, <laughs> two. Two. Or maybe two, two. Yeah, oh two. Yeah, so I if you have 19, one child would be 5.5% of your whole population. So two kids. So two, two children. But usually, just, I guess, yeah. a stupid question, not a stupid question, but in, we'll say third grade and math, the one or two people who got the 11% yeah. over here, would we know that before the test was taken that these kids really need that little extra help already? We probably probably do. know. Probably, but this was such a new thing that yeah. we really had no idea how the kids would actually handle the actual situation. Um, chances are good when we get these data back. Our, our teachers track, and I'm going to show you when we get to the report card, so many data points on kids and really that there's very few surprises. We can usually guess who's going to be stressed, try to provide support for those children. But this one, it was fresh out. And some kids kind of checked out in the state when they were giving it on, you know, like, forget it. I'm not going to answer three parts and on the computer. And you can imagine, you know, the, the challenges of that. Yeah, I don't think that the two in the red, I don't think that necessarily, necessarily reflects their ability. Right, right. You know, there might have been, I, I, I don't know who those students were, but you know, the, the teacher might know what, what happened during those times. You know, it might have just been, there was just too much screen time. So there's a lot of, there's an added component that when we go to the digital that didn't used to exist. 
that could be to some kids' advantage and some disadvantage. Some students hold on to their attention better when they're looking at a screen. So here we go, fourth grade did about as state average, except fewer students in the not meeting. Mm -hmm. So there that's again, good it could be just one kid. That is one, yeah. I mean, that's one. It, I know when you talk about percentages of a population this small, it's and so and then here's the map, <coughs> very similar. Except what we were really pleased with is look at all the blue. That is a that is the most rigorous test. The fourth grade math is quite rigorous, but. More kids in Waitley scored there than four times as many. It's probably four children um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> scored in advance. But that—that's really um, we were pleased with that. Um, the ELA fifth grade. You can see more green. Um, that's what you want to see: more green and blue. And um, we did have a number in the ELA in fifth grade who who really struggled with it. I also want to say that our regular teacher wasn't there for part of the year, and she's so used to prepping the kids. She was out on maternity leave. So we had a sub who was trying her best to prepare students for a test she hadn't seen. And it's, it's you know, it just is what it is. And then the math, about, about similar to the state in fifth grade. So we were pleased with this, even though they had a long-term sub, and the kids, um, it was new. They did, wow. and this is compared to most fifth graders, or many fifth graders took a pencil paper. It was only fourth grade that had to take it on the computer. We opted to take it on the computer. So the fact that they did this well, first time out, using a Chromebook, we were quite pleased with. Um, here's sixth grade. So what do you notice for sixth grade? Nobody. Right, nobody. And more in the, uh, the greens and blues is where we want to see it. And then um, here's sixth grade math. Wow. So first time out wow. using computers compared to uh, kids who also took it on the pencil paper, we were very pleased with the performance of Waitley students. Did we get a, a good feedback from all the kids from the grades? Did they have a tough time? Didn't they have a tough time? Um, did, did you heard? Did you heard any? Yeah, I mean, I think that in general, the kids felt frustrated with parts of the test, but I think, as Louise said, for some kids, it's starting to come into their wheelhouse in some ways, you know, because they, they live in the digital world, you know, and, uh, and it's kind of forcing them to learn. You know, we were very concerned as the adults in the building about, um, boy, using a digital ruler, right? You have to pull it down on the screen. Have it, has anybody used it? You can spin it around. You have to move it over here to measure this side of the tree. Yeah. Use your cursor to move it over that. here. They're doing that and on the Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's like a video game. They also, have, they also have things like, if you're a student who really wants to focus on one part of what you're reading, there's a box with a clearance in the middle that you can scroll down so you can only see what you want to see, kind of like using you know, if I use a piece of paper, paper over to read so I can go line to line. And we were thinking, I mean, I think some of us even thought, do we even want to introduce those tools? It could be overwhelming. But but I think a lot of our kids really embraced it and said, oh, this is cool. You know, now this is like a video game mm -hmm. to me, you know? So I think the answer to your question is, is mixed. I mm -hmm. think some kids really embraced it. I think some kids felt like, give me my pencil and paper back so I can really show you what I can do. Right. I think it was a mixed bag. Yeah. But they don't have a choice. No, no more, they no more choice. They don't have to do it this way. So yeah, they no have to choice. prepare them for this. Yes. Yeah. And eventually every grade will have to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So starting this year, all the grades? Starting this year, they're still optional. We're still going to opt in. Our, our goal is to give the kids as many opportunities as they can because it's, it's really low stakes. We try to prop them up and say, don't worry, you know, do your best. There's no consequence to you if you don't do well, really. We don't tell them that. So my own daughter announced it when she was in fifth grade. My mom says it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we certainly want kids to do their very best and show us, because we do analyze the data. When it comes back, we have meetings oh, yeah. and look at what areas. It's not just math. Like, how did we do in geometry? How did we do in algebraic thinking? And we look at that very carefully. Look okay. at each individual's oh. results. Mm -hmm. We look at every student, every and we look at aggregate um, trends. So we can see in fourth grade, what were the highest scoring compared to what we look at is there's a report that compares how our kids did compared to state average on different areas. And what I've always said is that controls for the difficulty of the test. In other words, if it was hard for you, it was hard for other fourth graders. So if we're at 
state average in geometry, but three points above in algebraic thinking, that's a relative strength because we're compared to the same peers. So we, we use those reports quite heavily and say, what is the <coughs> relative strength of this group? What does it mean instructionally? What, is the, what are the relative areas where they weren't as strong as their peers? So that, those are the reports that I find the most useful. Did you find any surprises when you did that? Or? We did better than I thought. <laughs> it sounds like overall you did better than you Because did. we were prepared. You know, I said to the teachers, our agenda this year is to get kids comfortable with taking this test on a computer. How we do is beside the point. We're not going to be an underperforming school. Just get them comfortable and make them feel like, you know, confident, comfortable. That's our agenda. Don't worry about the results. So we were prepared for these low results, and when they came back, we were actually pretty pleased. We also drilled down to type of question. We'll take right. a look at how did we do on multiple choice versus short answer, open response, essay questions, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then that informs instruction, you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. If our kids do poorly on short essays, right, short answers, but they do very well on maybe a longer essay, right, that tells us something, mm -hmm. and, and then we work on those skills. Mm -hmm. And, and I also look across the district, and what, one thing I was really pleased at, the fourth grade is, it has one of the more rigorous, historically, tests to do well on, comparatively. And um, this year, our fourth grade, one of the hardest parts of the whole test was um, English language arts, comparative writing, like they had to compare and contrast. It's not called open response, it's called um, constructed response. Mm -hmm. There's open response and there's constructed. <coughs> constructed response is, here's two, two pieces of literature, compare and contrast, use evidence from the text, quote, wait, the kids do really well on that, like way better than the state, way better than the rest of the district. Mm -hmm. So that was really um, exciting and um, you know, was very affirming, I think, to the hard work that the kids did and the teacher did. I also want to say that on top of knowing for a fact that they include questions that are above grade level, because that's what Massachusetts does, um, the fact that the test is in March and April and you know that we may not have gotten to all of that curriculum yet doesn't stop the state from putting <laughs> questions right. from the whole year. So you know, there have been times when we've been analyzing with a teacher and it's like, wow, how come everybody bombed on this question? The teacher says, I, I haven't covered that yet, you know, at, right. at that point in the year. That was like three weeks after the test, we started covering that, you know? So, not only that, there's a lot of things. We had five snow days. So, they literally lost an extra week of school between when snow started flying until MCAS. Right. So, that is lost time on learning. Yes, we make it up in June, but after the testing. The test Good point, Lynn. I forgot about all those snow days. I bet you did, but I did. <laughs> Right, so you know, it, it's, it's, it is discouraging to teachers when they do see questions and they think, oh, I didn't even get to that yet because it's only March or April. Mm -hmm. But you know, we try to take the pressure off the students and say, you know, do yeah. the best you That's can. Yeah. So did the other three schools do all computers too? Yes, our whole district. Yeah. We made that decision as, a, as an administrative team, just let's just practice it low stakes and get them used to it and then we could figure out do we need to we figured out we need to introduce keyboarding a little earlier than third grade let's get the kids starting in second grade to feel comfortable some of it is just done with you know games of getting to know the keyboard and there's a lot of components here mm -hmm. so um, so that is MCAS and then I'm going to just quickly switch to something that you're shortly going to get is um, the new report cards and I wanted to show you something that's going to go on all our websites. I wrote um, a, a message and a guide that will go home in paper, but we're also going to post it because I put live links in for <coughs> families to understand our new report card. So in describing, you know, what are the standards and benchmarks, the live link will take you right to what, where they came from, which is the state. So if somebody wants to say, well, what, is, what are these standards? We can go right back to that. Um, I have um, something about, we did change our grading to, we eliminated this M plus, and I'll tell you why. One of the things we found is a lot of the standards, there is no ability to go beyond it. So for example, the standard is, names all of the coins 
US coins and their values. Okay, how do you do an M plus on that? Canadian coins? I don't know. <laughs> so teachers have struggled with this for a long time and sort of were trying to figure it out. And it was not as consistent as we like from teacher to teacher and school to school about what is this M plus thing. So what we did is we looked at research and we um, looked at, okay, meeting the expectations. Our standards are rigorous, and so the M is how you meet it. And here's some examples of ones that, how, how could we possibly give an M plus on? Solve subtraction within 100. If you go beyond it, it's a different standard. It's a, it's a totally different standard. Uses punctuation and capitalization accurately. Well, how do you get more than accurate? And um, so here's some examples to show that we've really, frankly, struggled with this for years. Teachers have said, well, M plus, what does it mean? So is it depth of thinking? We used to think that would be a great idea to show that a student who shows more depth of thinking would be M plus. And I'm not getting an M plus on scrolling right now. Um, but what we've, what we've found through really looking and redesigning our report cards is we're expecting depth of thinking because look at the state tests. If you don't have depth of thinking, you're not going to do well. So here's examples of, they're in our standards, they're different standards. So knowing your coins is not deep thinking. You know, you might know a quarter is 25 cents and it's worth more than a dime. But constructing an argument and evaluating the reasoning of others is something we're doing even from very young. So for instance, which amount of coins could you use to buy these items and what would be the best buy for your money? Well, now you've got, there isn't one right answer for the, what the best buy. I'm gonna make an argument and critique how your argument was on applying critical thinking. So what we've determined after a lot of conversation, we worked for two years with a consultant who's actually coming back, Mike Anderson, who worked on helping us really differentiate instruction, focus instruction on the needs of the learner, not teach to the middle, but teaching kids where they are, that we found that the M plus wasn't as useful as it used to be. And you know, our people, um, the concern about would kids lose their motivation, and what we're trying to do with uh, the way we're teaching is encourage intrinsic motivation. You're learning, it's really joyful to learn and not focus on the grade, like what did I get? So taking that away um, is something new. So I put this out there so that parents could understand what, that their child isn't doing worse, and we didn't lower the standards, we're just looking at them differently. So yes. just to make sure that I'm understanding this mm -hmm. well, Louis. So you, you and I read the same short novel, right? Um, the teacher grades us on how well we comprehend the novel. We both do pretty much equally well on it. The teacher then starts looking at inference, for example, right? And maybe I'm just not there yet. I can't infer really what the author maybe was trying to tell me about a greater social issue as well as you do, right? So maybe in the past, we might have thought, well, wow, she really is going to get an M plus here because she has inference. But what you're saying tonight is that inference is another standard, right? So the teacher could say, you've mastered this standard and you're, you're beginning to approach or approaching mastery in another standard, exactly. which is inference, rather exactly. than calling it an M plus in in reading. comprehension. Or yeah, an M plus, exactly. It, it's not just, it, you know, comprehension. Do you comprehend the story? Now can you make inference, which is going deeper? That's a separate <clears throat> standard, and exactly as, as, um, as Pete described. So we're not, if that, we're not rank ordering kids as much as saying, we're expecting all of you to get there. You might be at the beginning stages, you might be approaching it, but we're gonna get all of you there. And so, um, so how are some of the ways we measure student achievement? Oh, and again, I'm posting this so that families who are interested, they can say, okay, how do you, how do you measure my child's reading? Well, here's the actual assessment. Um, it's called Fountas and Pinnell. It's a benchmarked reading system. This is what we use. We wanna be transparent about that and where is my child? Well, if my child is in third grade and it's December, and my child in third grade in December got an approaching, what did that mean? 
Well, it means they can read a text level M. Okay, what does that mean? So you can look up, okay, my child got this grade, what does that mean? So right in here, what do those text levels mean? Here's descriptions of what at each text level the skills are, what kind of texts those are. So an M, if we give that child who's approaching in third grade, these are the kind of texts that child is starting to read. Simple fantasy, realistic fiction, content is carried by print rather than pictures. In other words, we're moving away from pure picture books, more print. So a parent can understand better, what does that M mean? And, this is my favorite part. <laughs> okay, you told me this. What are the books? And so there are librarians and teachers, not in our district, but this is at a national level, who've put together this list of, okay, you're at a level M, here's a bunch of books that are just right for you. You can read these books. And so this, we're hoping, is really helpful that parents can look through and say, oh, okay, oh, here's some chapter books my child is ready for. Oh, where are we gonna see this? This is all here? gonna be posted to the website, in fact, maybe even tomorrow. The report cards are coming home. So I put this together. You're gonna get this in print, hard copy, right in the report card, and it's gonna say, if you want to see the live links, just go to the website. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing will be posted. And then you can just click on those And you can just click on the report card. Which will say what level they're reading at? The report yeah. card's going to say an M or an AP For or a BG. So yes. Is that what we just saw? That yes. one? What you're going to get is the actual, and I'll show you an actual report card. So your child will have, say, reading comprehension. Might um, be at a reads grade level text is one of the standards might be, say, approaching, and you think, what does that mean? You can see this chart and say, oh, that means he's at a level M. Well, what does that mean? This is what it means. We couldn't put, I mean, we didn't want to hand a telephone book to all the parents, yeah, yeah. but we wanted to be as transparent as possible and to support families in saying, you know, I really want to help my child. She's approaching. I want her to move towards, what are the books that would be meeting? Maybe we can read some of these at home. Maybe I can buy her some of these books for her birthday that are, you know, just at her level. So it'll give you an idea of, of exactly what they can read. So that, that's all going to be on the website. Again, this hard copy is going to go home and just saying, you know, for those of you interested, this is all posted. And then so we also, yeah, where on, on your website, on the Frontier school, website? Uh, each school each website. School. So you go to Frontier Regional in Region 38, and then click on schools, and then you pick school your school. Have it. Right. And, and I think this it's also is, going to be on the main page, yeah, too. Exactly. We're going to make it really easy to find, because report cards go home this Friday, mm -hmm. and we wanted to have as much information without overwhelm. Like, you can bite off as much information as you're ready for. So this will be folded right in with the report cards. That explains, and then it also says, you know, this is, this is going to be posted on your website if you want to look at the links, because really it would be hundreds of pages. Um, so this explains all of this, and then also other kind of, this is um, the map testing that uh, Dr. Carrick was talking about. What is it? What does it measure? Why are we doing it? So that families interested can look at that. Your um, students in grades three, four, five, and six taken in the fall, we would take it again and it gives us a normative measure. What's nice about these tests is unlike MCAS, it will tell us this child's on the 65th percentile nationally, and it shows you national averages, not just within Massachusetts, which is the highest scoring. If you're average in Massachusetts, you're above average. <laughs> so, but it also shows the growth. And it shows and that's the, the beautiful thing about that. The um, RIT scores show growth. Right, so if we give it in September and January, and there are all these really nifty graphs that say this is where you started, this is where you are now, and it breaks it down by here you are in geometry, algebra, et cetera. So we can really use those data. Then um, writing, you know, again, to be transparent, this is how we score writing, is we use um, an on-demand prompt, and these are the rubrics. So we want people to see, okay, if your child is reading on grade level in first grade, here's some of the things they can do, and this is how we assess it. So even though it just looks like, oh, I got an M, what does that mean? We're trying to show the, all of the work that goes behind it for teachers to ensure that students are reaching our high standards. So we have rubrics, 
there are, these are, um, this is called a pro learning progression, which shows all the grades. So what I just showed you was a, a small piece of it. This is, okay, you know, the whole from K to six, PK to six in narrative writing. Here's all of the skills that we develop. This is the continuum of what we're working on in writing. So this is trying to make our curriculum transparent too. Spelling, again, um, we're, we're looking at spelling stages and students are assessed um, on something called Words Their Way, which is a, um, a spelling assessment that gives us a, a level. It's not just right or wrong, but it tells us what level of spelling is this child working within. And those descriptors are right here. What does all of that mean? Here's an explanation. And this explains, you know, what is this stage, letter naming? What does it look like when a child is there? What does it look like when they're at the different stages? So, um, again, to make that transparent. And then our district, based on these levels, has made grade level expectations. So if your child is getting a M in December, in, say, fourth grade, grade this is the level they are spelling at. If they're getting an AP, they're at this level. There are 13 different levels. So again, it looks like, oh, just M, AP, but there's a lot that goes into it. So you can see, oh, what does that mean? You can go back to the other one and say, oh, this is, this is what it looks like. My child's writing does look like that. And the beginning, there's three levels, beginning, approaching, meet. If you're not there, you're at the beginning level. We didn't need to list that. Um, so, so you should go from, if you're early syllables in fourth grade, for example, and you're mm -hmm. meeting, but you never progress, then you become approaching by the end of the year. Yes. Early syllables, it kind of spans, early syllables is long, like most of fourth grade, you're working on this syllabication. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the year, if you're still, if you haven't demonstrated the next level, then you're at approaching. Mm -hmm. Does that make so sense? So once you get an M, doesn't mean you stay at an M. Correct. Just like with the reading, the level you need to read at to get an M in December is different than March and different than June. We're expecting growth. So the M means a different thing at each um, part of the year. So I'll go back to that to just demonstrate when that. When we talk about the maps, that score changes. It's uh, standardized. It's normalized across the country. Right. So what the RIT score is expected in September is different than what's expected in December because the expectation is a child has grown. Right. And the higher you get up, the less RIT scores you go up. So if you're a kindergartner, you go up 10 points because you're, you're a sponge. But in sixth grade, the expectation could only be two points to be at mastery or making it. Right. But the, the, the target changes because the growth is up. <coughs> exactly. And what? so this is an example here. In December, if you're a second grader, if you're around H or I, you're still approaching. You need to be at J for meeting. But in March, if you're still at J, now you're, you're approaching. We're expecting growth. Mm -hmm. And this is based on um, there are charts that a lot of reading teachers across the country use. Our teachers, our reading specialists, took that chart, really analyzed it, and made the levels that they felt meant Massachusetts. So these are our state, our district expectations for the growth. Um, so yeah, so that, that will help a parent understand if they got an M in December and now they're AP, what happened? Well, they didn't necessarily go backwards. Maybe they didn't make the progress that we are expecting. And what does that mean, and how can we help them? So, so is the goal for all the students to be M's at the end of the year? That, that I is, I yeah, it's different than traditional grading with. where we're thinking of the bell curve and everything. The goal is that we'll get everyone there. It's unusual that every single child meets all of the standards and everything. I mean, that the standards are rigorous. But our goal is certainly to support and to help students get there. And one of the things, we, we don't average grades now. We have um, a computerized system where teachers are entering the data. So if they assess the students, they enter it. And we're looking at um, what is the most frequent. So for instance, a child who is, say, inference. Say we gave three assessments of inference. And the first one, yeah, it was hard, didn't do so well. The next one, a little better. The third one, really got it. 
on the report card, we're going to say you got it because you showed. We're not going to average in that you were didn't used to know how to do it, and now we're going to tell you you're just AP. As I say, that's a standards-based way of um, grading is saying, what can the child do now? That's more relevant. Like, as I always say to teachers, when you go to take your driver's test, they don't watch video clips of the first time you ever drove <laughs> and that's say, that's very boy, yeah, ways. that's an important you, distinction, I think, in how you explain what yeah. The, yeah. the grade, right. to people grades right. mean something. Exactly. Right. It's right. mastery. So it's about, you might have to try 10 times, but if on the 10th time you pass your driver's license, your driver's test, guess what? You yeah. get your license. That's a mastery assessment. They don't care that you took it six other times. This is the set of standards. That's what standards-based grading is about. If you can show me that you can write an opinion piece and use um, evidence from something you read, and that was my standard, if last month it was really hard for you, that's part of learning. What averaging does is penalizes the learner for the learning. Mm -hmm. But when they move to middle school, that is grading. They are working so on that it. is different. They are totally revamping their grading system up at Frontier. Totally. They are looking very carefully because they have been reading, they spent the summer, a big group of teachers reading books about assessment yeah. and about accurate and standards-based assessment. Grades will probably will still exist definitely at the high school level, but you know, there are there are high schools that don't <coughs> give grades. I mean some of the private schools do that. Um, and there's, let's face it, there's grade inflation. We're trying to be more descriptive than just give everyone an M because it makes them happy. We're, we're very, you know, teachers are very careful about ensuring that that's really where um, is accurate. And so that's why we're trying to provide um, as much information to families as we can without, again, without overwhelming. This will go home in paper. And for people who feel like, okay, I believe you, there's too much information, they don't have to come check this, but I know you're families doing who are. Weekend. <laughs> so this is it, yeah, I won't take you through everything, but yeah, here's all of our rubrics. So we're trying to um, reach out to families and explain, even though this new report card only has three grades, we haven't lowered our standards by any means. They're rigorous, but we're just taking away the focus on what did I get to what can I do. So that's the new report card. Great job. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank right. you. Thanks. Yeah. These assessments that they're doing are, are the best. And, and I really have been in the business for a long time. I did my doctorate work on it. And Fontes and Pinnell, I, you know, I can't say enough. Um, they really cracked that nut open and really defined. And um, I was thrilled when, when I came here and I applied for the job and I, when I found out that they, they used those assessments, the MAPS assessment. The, the MCAS, it's just, it doesn't hold the same um, information on a child. To, to me, you, you're not going to know a child from the MCAS. It's one day, one shot. I mean, they have two sections. They're 45 minutes each. I think the kids spend two hours doing ELL and 90 minutes doing the math, but it's not, it's not, it's not what this is all about. These report cards are so well thought out and so well planned. Uh, it's it's a tremendous amount of work, and I'll tell you, they're they're ahead of the curve on this, really, mm -hmm. across the country. This is they're way ahead of it. So, how do you motivate the kids, though? I mean, I I, I hear what you're saying, and it's really interesting, mm -hmm. different way of assessing kids and helping the parents understand where they stand on given the standards. So you have to know what the standard is. Mm -hmm. before you can really know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you motivate the kid that gets M's everywhere? We try to de-emphasize it's not about your grade. You know you're, you're there. Right. What more can you do? And so that's with the work we've done with this consultant, Mike Anderson, of looking at small group instruction. So students who've already reached that standard, mm -hmm. what can we do to challenge you to do something different? And so it's it's not about the grade anymore, and it's de-emphasizing doing it for the teacher or doing it for the grade, but rather doing it because I'm really excited to like learn to do the science kind of process or to learn the next step. So it is a process. I mean, we all grew up with grades and wanting to get an A, but that's focused on doing it for a reason that's for somebody else kind of, or mm -hmm. it's a reward. We're building 
learning as its own reward. It's a shift, mm -hmm. and still some kids, I'm sure, are disappointed. I wanted my M pluses, but frankly, in some cases, they, they didn't really mean what, what we, they didn't, we didn't have a clear definition. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we would give them because it made the kids happy. We got an M plus because we know you're a top student. So the report cards are really about how are you doing in our standards, which are rigorous, the, the uh, critical thinking that we're expecting of students, the social development. So the shift is towards the learning and away from the grade, making you motivated because you're excited to learn versus you're gonna get an A or what did the teacher give me? So it's, it is a shift mm -hmm. and I know it's, it's a process, but um, I think it's worthwhile because it shifts the focus on getting excited about your own growth, putting you in control of your own growth. And the fact that um, you can take that test again. You still have a test. You can still get an 80 on a test. We're just going to say, to get an M in this, we're gonna expect X. So it varies. As somebody said, you know, if you're, if you're crossing the street, what, is, what percent do you want correct to not get hit by a truck? You want 100, right, for an M for that. But other things, you might like writing an essay. Maybe if you got three out of four of the parts that I've asked of you, that's what I'm expecting in December. Now, in January, we're gonna expect four out of four. So it's, it's shifting the ownership to the child. And if you took an assessment, you're not happy with it, you take it again. Because we're showing you with a benchmark. There's no gotcha. There's no, you know, I'm giving you an M. This is, we're trying to be transparent with kids. This is what you have to do. You can do it. I wouldn't ask you to do it if you couldn't. So it's a shift in thinking. It's, teachers have worked really hard to um, make that really transparent to the students themselves. But as families, as parents, we're accustomed to looking for those M pluses or the A's. So it's going to be a shift. And that's why um, we made the effort to put so much information and to say, you know, keep the conversation going with your classroom teacher. How, you know, is, is my child um, going deeper with some of this? These are, when we talk about 21st century skills, these are not what we're, what we're helping the children develop today are not your reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. It's that deep thought, it's that um, inquiry-based learning. It's the project-based, small group, working with someone, <coughs> problem solving, but it's really looking at different ways to solve one problem. And it's not as concrete. It's not as tangible. It's, it, it's again, it's using the mind in different ways and growing. But when they get out into society or college, they need to be, they need to be really wide open, flexible thinkers. And that's what we're trying to teach them here. And that's why these rubrics are so much more descriptive than numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and children do a lot more self-evaluation. So, so for instance, that rubric that I showed you, we wouldn't give the kids the whole rubric. There's a checklist. Mm -hmm. And you say, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? Oh, I forgot to do this part. So again, it's the ownership instead of in my day, I'd hand it in, the teacher would grade it, and done, done. I, we never used to revisit and say, oh, I gotta do that again. I'm gonna do it better this time. I'm gonna go deeper this time. And um, so that's, this, that's the big shift, and we're excited. I, you know, walking into Waitley and walking into classrooms, kids are involved in such meaningful tasks and learn, learning experiences. It's really a pleasure to see. There's no busy work, I'm really thinking. Thank you. So, thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you so much. I wish my kids were in school today. <laughs> <laughs> because they just struggle with a lot of them. Yeah. Right or wrong, left or white. Okay, so we'll skip back to capital projects. Is it a capital update? Is that right? Yeah, okay. So, the, um, there was a conference call on Friday with um, Ryback Engineering, uh, the Sprinkler and Fire Protection Consultant, Bob Lesko, John Penham, and Jim Cerrone, um, the Franklin County Inspector, Brian Dama, Town Administrator. So they talked about dealing with the issues related to the sprinkler system. There was a $30,000 proposal uh, to have the consultant 
do the uh, analysis and evaluation. So he he gave this contract and it's thirty thousand dollars. This quote. <coughs> so they talked about um, Ryback uh, discussed that twelve thousand dollars of the quote was an allowance for hiring a sprinkler contractor to assist with the testing. And they that they would get samples, require flushing connections, replace sprinklers, and facilitate internal inspection. So the problem is it would be difficult to make um, a final bid at this point because it would it would require bids without design documents and it could go up to a hundred thousand dollars. So the town has approximately $25,000 left in their account to deal with the sprinklers. We also know that we have sprinkler heads which are required to be replaced and that's $37,000. So um, it's a difficult problem that's been going on for some time. The actual contamination and corrosion of the piping and potential blockage is a new development. However, a project was designed and bid in 2012 using a mechanical design firm, uh, Lindgren and Sharples, and those bids came in at around 90000 to look at this stuff. Um, but it was well over budget. It was decided not to move forward uh, with the larger project at that point and to use budgeted funds to continue with these ongoing, ongoing repairs. So the overall magnitude of the work um, and the risk to the town, they we're going, they're, they're thinking about going ahead with this proposal for Thursday, the town meeting with the selectmen in Waitley uh, within the next week or two. And they're going to discuss providing the extra funds to make up this $30,000 quote, whether they feel that they want to uh, spend the money on the analysis and evaluation and then come back perhaps for the spring vote and fix it. fix it depending on what they find. I mean they could, there's a chance they could blow up, they could come and part of their work would be to blow out all the corrosion and put some gas in there, an inert gas that would just stop the corrosion, but they don't know. Mm -hmm. and. So it is a $30,000 quote. They're highly recommended. They've been working on it. Uh, I'm grateful to Brian Domina for taking the lead on this. And it is a capital improvement uh, thing that's not going to go away. It's an issue that's not going to mm -hmm. go away. And so my sense is that we will, um, before June or January, uh, this might come before the town. Not this, but. Mm -hmm. Putting aside, the bigger project. Putting so aside this is just to evaluate and assess what the bigger what's needed overall, mm -hmm. and then there's a project that project needs to be defined. And what is the cost for the assessment? Thirty thousand. Wow. So would they use the thirty five, the twenty five? They need. That? They need, a little, they need a little bit more. So that's what my understanding is. That's what they're going to ask for at the town meeting mm -hmm. that they have uh, the select meeting. Uh, no, it's they, a town meeting this month. It's, it's a town meeting. They're going next to ask week. Next Monday or Tuesday? And, uh, I have a school committee meeting. But uh, that's my understanding. So if anyone, you know, can support it. I, it's a big, it's a big blow. It, it, it's a big problem. And they kind of looked at it earlier, but this is what they came up with. So, um, so Brian's taking the lead on that. Yes, yeah, because he's he's there and he deals directly with the town mm -hmm. and the, the FinCom and and those folks. So uh, he's been gracious to take care of that to do this. Um, it is kind of a town building, and uh, he's been great uh, keeping us informed and and but doing a lot of the legwork. Mm -hmm. So the other capital improvement is our intercom and our clock system. The phones, really. It's the phones. Thing, yeah. So the request from our um, IT uh, director, Scott Hoff, <coughs> who's wonderful, was before we do any kind of uh, connectivity in the building, that we get an air conditioner put in that closet. <laughs> so we had 4,500 set aside from the school committee to put that AC in that closet. And uh, 
we did a lot of work over the summer, but that did not get done. So this week, this very day, we I had Bob check with GMRA to make sure that that $4,500 quote still stands. And if that's the case, then they'll put that in hopefully before Christmas and then before the holiday. And then um, the goal is they need to do some work uh, up in Conway and they'll come down here and do the work that needs to be done here. The other piece that's holding us up is the phone itself. They're, they're actually working, doing some studies on, they have a phone up in the uh, IT office, a phone of what they want to put in this building. Mm -hmm. And they're working on trying to make sure that the interface is good, that the interface is really appropriate, and that it will do everything we need to do. And there's so many kinds of digital phones, it's, it's tough. There, there's, there's voice over internet protocol. It took us so many months and so many meetings to get the phone system for the central office installed just in our part of the building. And so that's really been holding up the works. But once, once we pin the, that down, and they're working on it daily, mm -hmm. then we will come in and, and hopefully, I'm thinking right after the holiday, that um, the, whole, the whole thing will be done. So they don't have one phone system for the whole school, all district? I mean, the, There's what's holding all the districts. Up. That's what's holding us up on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And with copiers, and, and we have so many purveyors, so many vendors, right. so many different problems that can happen. Everyone is just, the goal is to make it consistent. Right now, we're working, we're working on Conway, but Conway, it's only uh, the intercom system. But that's a real um, problem there because it's not really working, uh, and it's a danger. That's that's a you, you know emergency. So we're working on that one. But the idea being, let's pick a phone <coughs> format, a phone a telecommunications format that would serve all the buildings, all the whole district. So we have one purveyor, one vendor, mm -hmm. and if something goes wrong, we can, you know, we'll have enough, yeah, and we'll have enough knowledge. Um, but that, to, sometimes it just takes too long to get caught up with the needs. Mm -hmm. The need is here now for phones. The need in the high school is there, but we have this huge bond thing, and now we're going to have a subcommittee, and then we're going to have to, so we can't, make people wait till we all catch up and then the money's not there. So, the different. so would we lose our money? Over no. This, we don't spend it this year? No. no. No, because your intercom system's warrant. So it stays there until we spend it. But it needs to be spent by June mm -hmm. uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. And it will be. Mm -hmm. so that's all I have for... So it's underway right now. Yeah, there's right. two things for our Okay, I have a question. That water fountain that's over there, is that linked to that pipe issue? No, no. That's any, all the water that's used for hand washing or drinking water is that's domestic water. This has nothing to do with the sprinkler. It's just like in your home. It's no, I was just wondering because it, it's been. Uh, yeah, it's because it leaks. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a leaky. And I told Katie earlier that I'm going to call Bob Lesko tomorrow and find out what the issue is. I think it was just one of those things that um, Patty had. Patty had written a grant, I think a year and a half ago maybe, to see if we could get the sports bottle type water fountains that Frontier has at least one or two, where you can drink from it, but you can also stick your bottle in there and fill your water bottle. The grant didn't come through, so that kind of you know, created a situation where we had to think of what do we do next. And then I think that you know, we looked into how much it would cost to just replace the thing, and it was more expensive than you might imagine. And I think at that point is when it ended up sort of in Bob Lesko's hands around what, how, how we're going to do this and what are we, you know the research, et cetera. And, and honestly, I, I need to get in touch with him and find out where we stand with it. Yeah. In the meantime, kids can fill their water bottles out of our water cooler. You know, So I don't want to give the impression that kids and recreation can't drink water here. They can. It's, um, <clears throat> it's bottled wine. Right. It, so it's there's a cost to it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to be going yeah. through a lot of that with, with basketball ball season. Ball. <laughs> and I think the public nature of the building, that, that mm -hmm. will start to hit on that water mm -hmm. once we start having more basketball. Yeah, this is a good time to get that water fountain fixed yeah. yeah. so. The grant that Patty had written was actually for dairy. 
and we were trying to get those water coolers for all the different schools, but it was hooked to, um, and I forget the name of it, but uh, they were great, but it was about the Dairy Council. And she, uh, when she realized that piece, then we, uh, she got a cooler for Deerfield out of the gram, but she tried with the water to say that if the more milk the kids eat, you know, drink, then the more water they'll drink, but <laughs> it didn't work. The, it's so hard when you talk grants because they're for specific right. things and our needs don't always line up perfectly. Okay. Softball field. Mm -hmm. talk about I'm going to let you take the lead on that. So I just want to be clear that what I, what I did, what I put in front of you is really just, um, if you remember, I think it was Bob, you brought it to our attention last month, right? Yep. That there was this, which I hadn't even heard about. I don't know if Central Office was aware of the possible move in the, in the softball field. And, and I just thought it was a fair thing to, to give me some time to tell my staff about it and to brainstorm with some other people about what kind of impact that would have on our campus here. So I think what you'll read there is, and again, I had to make some assumptions here. I don't know, you know. I'm, I don't know the answers to some of these questions, but if I was going to give you sort of a cogent, intelligent looking, you know, bunch of questions, we needed to make some assumptions um, <clears throat> about things that we either know or don't know about. For example, I'm not sure who maintains the field now, and I certainly don't know who's going to maintain it later. What I do know is if we're going to have to maintain it, that's, that's a concern, right? So, so that was one question that came up. Um, I also wonder if you know schools have regulations they have to follow around things like herbicides and pesticides and, and you know inside the building and out. Uh, recreation leagues may or may not. I don't really know. So again, I think we're just trying to think of all of those things that could potentially come into play. Um, so so as you see, what you have in front of you is a list of bullets of, of just questions or concerns that have come up, uh, as well as a little bit of speculation into the future. I am not. For example, if you look at the last bullet on the first page, um, having the field located in the same area as the current play, playground and kickball field would not be preferred for several reasons, right? And I yeah. outline what some of those reasons are. Um, the bullet right above it, um, on the other hand, is really a speculative question. So, okay, so now you've got this field down there at, at, at Christian Lane, and it's, it's, the lot is only as big as it is, right? This lot here is a whole lot bigger. So two years after the ball field goes in, somebody says, well, you know, that ball field, you know, the, the ball size, the field size that we use for second and third graders is really the same size that seventh and eighth graders use, so why don't we have seventh and eighth grade games go in there? And what I'm just trying to say through this document is, as those kinds of decisions get made, you guys, school committee, should be involved, because the more that, that potentially expands, if it does at all, if the field comes here, the more use it gets, the more impact it's going to have on this campus and our ability to use the field, traffic, trash, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, it may never change. They may continue to, I don't know who they use it for now, but if it's, you know, first, second, and third grade girls, and that they may bring the field here and it may never change. On the other hand, somebody from REC may say, why have we never used this as a soccer field? We could put a, you know, a three-quarter size soccer field on this field, right? We. I'm just trying to make the point mm -hmm. that this is still mm -hmm. Waitley Elementary School property and town property and that there probably needs to be somebody checking and balancing so that, you know, um, we don't start seeing softball practices out there before the day is over with kids who are done at the high school and coming down here to have softball practice or vice versa. You know, so these are just questions that we formulated based on what we could think of in terms of things that we should probably keep an eye on or anticipate moving forward. And if you've read it, um, you, yeah. you also are reading like the question. We'd love to have the field, but let's right. do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. These are good points, and I think a lot of these things happen at Hurley, where there is no school, and so it's good to anticipate right. what I, might happen to the extent of a shared field. I didn't put that question in here, I don't think, but it, it, it occurred to me to ask, are they considering another space, too? Is there another mm -hmm. space, or is, are we their only option at this point? I don't know the answer to that. And one thing that Lynn and I, I think, both wanted to clarify was, um, I thought that you said last month that Deerfield Recreation runs the girls softball league, right? Okay, yeah. So, uh, but all four towns participate. It's just it's just administered through right. Deerfield Rec. Right. They have all the equipment. I remember my girls went through. They always had all the equipment. They had a day where there was like a draft, and you know, you get picked for different things. I'm not sure if it happens in the lighter, you know, younger grades, but I know in the older grades it does. So. Okay. I just I think there's not enough 
people from Waitley to have Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I mean, in theory, it could be any one of the four yeah. towns. Rex could run it, but it happens to be Deerfield in this case. Right? So we just wanted to be, be clear that that. I, I had written this, when I first wrote this, I, where it's wherever it says recreation department, I had put in Deerfield Recreation, right. but then in talking with mm -hmm. Lynn today, we, neither one of us was 100% certain that that was what you had right. said. I mean, they run it, but I think our rec, Waitley rec would still be kind of your representative or your okay, advocate. Well that, even better. For, right. well, that would be my yeah. understanding. Your husband. Yeah. Right. Well, he's getting off then. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, <laughs> did you talk to him about this at all by chance? I did. And what's his opinion? Well, he's looking at other options. Oh. He said that there's a few, he has a few other ideas of other places where it might move. There is. They are wanting to add another field to Hurley, but they don't have enough land to actually add it there. So that's a challenge. Um, but the town has been exploring that option. So I'm wondering if that will come up at the town meeting, or will they wait? I don't think they're that far along. No. Think they're yeah. thinking on it. So the plan is, is to put the building, put the RFP up for our lot mm -hmm. and the town's lot in January. Wait 30 days, see what we get and then look at that and then make sure there's a lot of things you have to do to make sure that they can pay that da, da, da. and then by the time April comes if we get a real strong offer for the two lots then the plan was at town meeting mm -hmm. when everyone's in town in there to talk about selling these two lots and to discuss uh, you know a new softball field you know possibly you know that's yeah you know, if we're going to give up one, we got to have a place for the, the right. first, second, and third grade softball kids to go. And that's my whole intention was to have a field that we're taking away and have a place yes, for those that one. group to go. Mm -hmm. Not to say, you know, not to say that somebody may change their minds for more kids, like one of your things that you're talking about. But my thought was just a place for the young kids still to go, where there's other options for. The girl, the older girls, and the older boys to go play at their baseball because softballs played on their baseball fields too. Back when my kids went, so right. at all the schools right. and at, at all the fields, I should say. Who and certainly, here? And who plays here now? No one field plays is here. Not playable for those kinds of sports. Right. Oh, they just use it in the current recess? state. It's just yeah. A recess. Every now and then, a coach will come down after like hours very and young have a little kids. practice there. Yeah. But it's a that very small field. That probably yeah. The their outfield has got play structures. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, which is why locating it even at the other end of this field wouldn't work. Yeah. I mean, at that age, kids can hit the ball right into the place. And Don Skrowski uh, contact me. He says the only thing you have to maybe worry about out there that's where the leech field, field is. Field is. Yeah. And we would have to look at the blueprints and try to. Try to use the blueprints to help us design if we do it over there where to put the backstop right. where's That's that across the island across the island over yeah. on the other side yeah. over there right mm -hmm. or not to bring heavy equipment out on exactly all yeah. Those things. Yeah. yeah i mean i don't usually for a softball field you're just taking off a top layer of grass for the infield it should be fine right and really at the the response that i got from my staff was that it would be a nice addition so long as you know it's right. cooperative collaborative if we were selling the field to the recreation department, then it's theirs to do what they want. Right. But I wanted to make sure to say that if they do think about, well, we could use this field for this also, or to expand into other teams, that might be okay. I would, I, I would, would imagine be able to. It's on the school grounds for our kids to use during the day, because no one else should be using it not, not during only, the day. Not only that, yeah, we'd love to share it. I mean, right. it would be a win-win if we could you know, use the field when it's, when it's not. There might be times when they've just uh, done some work on it and they want the grass to grow so let's stay off it we all deal with that in our town so that's fine right. but my point was more you know if they decide that wow this is a nice field now we can use it for older kids too maybe that's a possibility but let's make sure that school committee whoever it is at that time has a chance to review the plan and make sure it doesn't impact our ability to use that field we do PE out there on a regular basis that's about all we do our field day is important to us too so it's it's there for the using but I just think we wanted to communicate well about it. And I appreciate and thank you for giving me the chance to get some feedback yeah. from my staff. Yeah. It seems like it would be analogous to the basketball, the gym. Yes, very the way much so. The gym That's is a great used, point. Um, very much so. And I think there's opportunity to work with rec, too, to get maybe some support, more support to the extent, like the trash is a real problem, bathrooms mm -hmm. and things. So. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the fields so we'd want to think about this. Like the one 
Does that one right. have a, a lot of them don't. You know, the the, the blue school doesn't have anything. I I've never been there when they had a portable toilet or but anything it's like good that. Because I see the portable toilet thought who, a bathroom or something. You know, I mean, it's That's only because I was told from staff that some of the fields have portable. Oh yeah, yeah, but that. a lot of them don't. The and one by the fire station doesn't have anything. Right, yeah. and and part of the issue. So so there, I don't know where people will go to the bathroom. Here, the expectation would be to come into. They the want to come in the school. That creates a whole yeah. other yeah. dynamic. And then there's traffic in the school. People coming and going. You know who's going to clean the bathrooms? It creates more work for the custodians. All of those things need to be considered. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so what is the next step on this then? Well, lines? the idea is at when when the town votes to sell the lot, or you know, to decide to accept the offer on the lot, mm -hmm. and to um, relinquish. You know, if we have an alternative for the ball field, then the next vote for the town members would be to vote that ten thousand dollar money that's waiting. We've got for upgrades. to upgrade that ball mm -hmm. field. Then they have to vote. Once they vote to sell the lot and, and the, you know, to move the ball field so that Frontier Regional can sell the, the blue building, mm -hmm. then they vote on the ten thousand dollars. Can we use that ten thousand dollars? They have to allow us to use it because it was written in the grant for Christian Lane, oh. and we have to be able to vote to change that location to wherever this yeah, new thank you. place that's ends. Say. They may find another spot that's probably more ideal. Right. So, Especially so we're at the point of really evaluating what options are available and or coming up with a plan potentially, so that when it is sold, hopefully, we have a place to. We mean. Brick, we the town, I guess. Uh, it, it's pretty much the town. Yeah. It's it's their field. It, it's it's on. It's there right away. Mm -hmm. It's their field on the blue school property. So. so they, the town, the rec. My husband needs to come back to us and tell us what they're right, doing. What they're and then, and then, and then we can weigh in on if it's going to be here. Then we'll whether we like it. Or with you guys about. Um, I think there's enough of space out there. Like I said, we could if you could drum up the. The plans of the school with the beach field, we can at least look at it. And, yeah. You know, if it's on that side, and we have to worry about it if we put it out there. And our, our tank is is closer to this side, so right. I'm guessing it's straight ahead. Yeah, and that that also makes me guess that if you're looking at the field, that the far corner closer to could the be where the backstop is would be a great spot. They for a backstop. Down, out this way. Yeah. Yeah. There again, we're only right now. We're talking okay. first, second, and third grade. So I don't think anybody's going to hit this car. <laughs> And whenever we get around to paving the lot, again, um, it would be nice to push some pavement onto that field and have vertical parking right, right there so that people yeah. are parking on the dirt. That'll help with town meeting, that'll help with spaghetti supper and pancake breakfast and all those other times that we get crowded all the way out to the road. Yeah. Well, it won't help because people yes. already park there, but it'll be easier to park. I park don't have to put your boots in mud. Yeah. You know, I park there. there. I do too. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I, mentioned I don't have a, I don't have a report. I don't know. Is there any it was a collaborative meeting. Um, it was much faster than the first one. That's good. Um, they just have annual reports, annual audit. Um, I don't think there's. Have they found a new home yet? No, that's ongoing. They decided since there's no rush, they are going to um, take their time. I was and just saying they formed a committee that has already been very active. Um, and um, they're taking their time to find the right location. Good. So this is they're the Northampton office they need to mm -hmm. Yes, they're looking to, because I think they're in a couple locations and parking is a huge issue where they are and where they park now might, that land might be sold. Um, it's not their land, I think they rent it, but there's some issues with that land and they're looking anywhere like in the 91 corridor in um, one of the two counties. So okay. they want to find the right location. Um, that, that was it. That was the yeah. right. Thank you. So you don't have anything else to report? Cool. Lynn, do you All I have is my goals. No. My um, advisory met, uh, it was three hours, mm. it was a long meeting, mm. but they were so encouraging and so supportive. 
and uh, it really, uh, really helped me to frame. So I'm just going to go quickly. Who was, can you tell us who was on the advisor? Yeah. Besides, Bob, I know Bob was, right? Yeah, Greg Gottschalk mm -hmm. from Sunderland, Trevor McDaniel from Deerfield, Elaine Campbell from Conway, and Cindy uh, Omet from Frontier. So the goals, if you look at the second page, these, the, and I explained to them what I sent to all the uh, school committees. The goals, I have three areas of goals I need to do. And I need um, at least one student achievement goal and one professional practice goal, and then how many, whatever, that the, uh, that the uh, district, for the district goals to meet. So I kept the communication goal to continue to strengthen it uh, through collaborative efforts. Um, I am facilitating the updating and or uh, adding new school committee policies as recommended by the Massachusetts Association. We have over 99. Bob's on that committee. You know, we might want to think about meeting like at 6 in the morning or something or 6.30 or something to, <coughs> I'm just saying, yep. um, because whatever. And then um, the budget process, including a financially sustainable vision, will be completed in collaboration with the school committees, district administrators, and other stakeholders. And that's what I'm talking about when I say we're going to, I'm going to try and present the night. I'm going to meet with the pr principals on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of things for them to fill out. I'm asking each principal for a narrative of their what is the great stuff that happened this year that you did with the money? What are the improvements? You know, we've gotten floors. We were so grateful. We did this. We had this summer camp here. This year, the new thing we're doing is something, in, you know, those kinds of things. So that we also have that human narrative to go with all the money. Yeah. And I'd like to do actual pictures, too, to go with it. Not photographs, but actual pictures to help people frame their understanding. And I understand that. Um, so the student achievement goals, 100% of our students pre-K to 6 will participate in at least one engineering design project and one new science unit aligned with the 2016, 2016 uh, science curriculum standards as uh, evidenced by formative and summative assessments. And in June 2018, by June, students in grades 7 through 12 will be responsible for summarizing at least two science informational documents based on Collins writing uh, strategies as evidenced by science faculty developed summary rubrics. So when Louise said to you that the whole, the high school is in the middle of changing all their assessments, that's part of our strategic plan, which, is, which was assessments, was curriculum assessments and special ed, and developing more meaningful assessments for students at the high school, the junior and, high, the junior and senior high school level. So this is uh, district, uh, building-wide, department-wide, all the, the science teachers are, uh, and the technology teachers are working together on that. Uh, professional practice, the superintendent will have successfully completed year two of the uh, Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents new superintendent induction program. And again, the superintendent will continue to develop a professional network, including the Massachusetts Association of Rural Superintendents, Connecticut Valley Superintendents Roundtable, and the Franklin and Hampshire Superintendents Collaborative. So if you turn to the next page, you'll see the goals specified with actions. So last year, my understanding was the goals, well, all of it was too much. I mean, I gave everybody a buy and it was too much, so they said, you know, go simpler this year. So I went simple, but it wasn't enough. So people really didn't understand. So when you see the objective, the objective of what the green of what the um, of what the goal is the there's the objective these are the actions and then the resources the timeline and then the benchmarks of what you'll see and the artifacts of what I'll show you at the end of the year so the objective is to continue to develop communication systems within and across the school district and within the greater community so we're continuing to reach out more, and I'm continuing to reach out more to the school committee members. I have to be very careful because of open meeting law. I can't say, you know, but I do send you a news week every two, a newsletter every two weeks, kind of telling you what I'm doing and uh, 
you know, anything that's coming up or things you should be looking at, I will notify you if anything happens that can, you know, that happen that actually impacts Waitley. You know, I get right on email and call me, let me know, and uh, communicate that. I'll let you know, and then. Um, so um, anyway, the next goal you'll see on the next page to ensure district policies are uh, cohesive and aligned with current state and federal regulations. And again, we talked about that goal. This is going to take a lot of the spring to do. And um, that's why I'm wondering if we can't meet earlier. Some of the people on the committee work, but if we could do it early and get an hour and a half in and then they go to work, have there been a lot of changes? Sorry to the poli to the regular. Well, I thought I the policies were all up to date. Yeah. Yeah. They were. They were. They were. They were. They were. I was on the last committee. We changed a lot. Yeah. So now there's 99 that we have. There's some that's just language, mm -hmm. and there's some that's just taken out. Mm -hmm. And I'll show the committee that. Mm -hmm. There's 99, and you know what happens when we go through them? Then we bring them to you. Mm -hmm. You all have to vote. It would be great if I could have them all done by April for the joint meeting. But anyhow, so um, the budget process. To refine the budget process and ensure that it includes a financially sustainable vision and aligns to the district strategic goals and the school improvement plans. So, and again, I'm rolling that out next week and we'll continue to talk about that process. And, um, Definitely be, you know, to, to reach out to the stakeholders. Uh, again, I've developed a community, of, a network with the town administrators so that I'm on top mm -hmm. of things in the towns. And um, as much as we want them to come here to listen to our budget deliberations, uh, you know, we need to go to them mm -hmm. before the town meeting so that they kind of understand where we are and what, what our needs are. Um, student achievement goals, again, the pre-6, pre-K-6 engineering projects, engineering design project, and a science unit. These teachers are engaging in um, training uh, from the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, and the, uh, they're using professional development time to collaborate on projects and activities across the grades. So even though there's only one third grade in Whiteley, the third grade third grades in Deerfield and Conway and Sunderland are doing the same projects. They're all working together on it and then coming back to share the learning that the students had. And I will have those uh, lesson plans and some um, examples of completed projects. I just observed one in Deerfield last week. It was, uh, they were floating, seeing how much their uh, ship mm. could. Uh, was that first grade? They did, you know, they did it in kindy. I think they did it with cranberries. I don't know what they did. My girls came home with yes, some tin ships. foil boats. Yeah, the ships. <laughs> they used all different. They designed their own so ship, they and then they works. saw they had the little like the class I saw had the little cubes like you stick together to count hundreds, you know, tens, and each team made made their boats, and then they floated them, and they just kept putting on to see who whose boat could hold the most before it sunk, and it, the kids. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's and so they're understanding. Well, I can see where they, this went out the side, so it didn't dip under, and th it, there's a lot of learning going on. But it's high order thinking, and it's pretty good. Um, and again, um, uh, students in grades seven through twelve, they'll be summarizing, which again is that comparative thinking, and the objective writing, and summarizing uh, science informational documents. And the, 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 the real focus here is the science faculty is developing the new rubrics. And we'll bring those rubrics. Now, we showed you rubrics for the elementary, which is, oh, what is, what's the writing? Who's, who's the writing? It's Lucy Cockins, too. Lucy Cockins. These people are writing, um, their, their writing is Collins writing program but their rubric is going to be generated. It's aligned with the um, its, uh, content area, a science and uh, career and technical subjects described 
in the 2017 uh, Ma Massachusetts ELA curriculum framework. So they're generating their own rubrics and trying to open up the way that they grade and, and really helping the students to understand and be reflective of their own work by looking at the rubrics and really trying to understand. So my professional practice goal is I will continue and I will complete year two. And um, again, I'll continue to work on the district strategic <coughs> plan to fully participate in uh, all cohort and coaching sessions. Ooh, that S doesn't belong there. Um, and complete related assignments to model to the administrative team that a mindset of personal growth uh, ensures that we are examining our, our best, our practice to ensure high quality and instruction for all. So to show them as I grow that, you know, and they're growing and we're all growing. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you, I make mistakes. And so being able to say I'm learning from my mistakes and I'm growing. Um, so then, um, again, the uh, professional network to develop professional relationships with colleagues for support and problem solving and implementing efficient systems uh, procedures. And so we worked on this for three hours. They were a great team. They worked really hard. And um, so the goal is, and it, it's not in the notes, so if you want to wait a month, you can, but I, I, I don't know, you know if you're willing to vote on to accept them. They, they have been thoroughly gone through a lot of work. So we need to vote on them? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Can we vote uh, next month? So sure. We just have a chance yeah, to digest it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's Looks great. Looks great. Good job. Well, it was a, it was a lot of work. Yeah. It was a team effort. So, yeah. Yeah, but not <clears throat> You didn't make it. <laughs> I, I had another meeting that night, so I'm sorry. I was looking uh, forward to it. Is this structure like some of this? Is it um, something that was recommended at one of those superintendent training? No. Um, I kind of used this last year, uh, but last year I'm telling you, like, talk, talk about overachieving. It was, it was, it was crazy, and people still really didn't get it. You know, you're asking people who don't really know what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and you're saying, well, you know, you need to evaluate me. And so the goals are a great way to say, these are what I'm working on this year, and this is what I did not give you artifacts. There's four standards, and it's very long. I, I'm hoping I can make them a little shorter. But the beauty with this is, halfway through the year, I'll meet with the advisory committee again, and then we'll go over <coughs> the progress I'm making. And then they'll be able to say, yes, you know, the progress is there, this is what's happening. And Who's then it's gonna go over the progress, that committee that yeah. has this. And then at the end of the year, I'll be able to present to them and, and then, you know, we move on from there. But it's very hard um, if you're not communicating on a daily basis, if you're not, you know, you, you know, come and see what I'm working on and but depending on the format of the of how they're written, it can make it easier or not so yeah. easy when it's time to evaluate. Yeah, I think that this will make it easier. I do. It, it, I'm telling you what my actions are. These are the artifacts I'm going to show you. And uh, the problem is I have five school committees. Mm -hmm. And they're all different. And they all want different things. And we need them to focus in on one person. And they need to focus in on, okay, this is what she'll do. But you can always ask me to do, you know, like, call me up and say, well, Lynn, at this committee, I need you to talk about this. Katie says, can we talk about capital improvements? You want to talk about capital improvements at every meeting, mm -hmm. the status of them. So I can do that for you, but I, I don't do that for another committee. But when you have 24 bosses and they don't even see you but once a month, it's, I'm going to tell you it's, it's a very hard uh, very difficult position and they don't understand the complexities and there's so many little things and big things that come along and I can't tell everybody everything you know we do have open meeting laws and so 
But I'm trying really hard to do. It goes back to that every school having their own district. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. problematic from a management yeah. perspective. It, it, <laughs> that's, that's the challenge. The, the job is, is doable, but because it's broken up, it's, it, and that's part of the reason why I told Patty, you know, she's working all day. I mean, I'm working, but that's, that's my job. I'm supposed to be here talking to you, but you know, you, you need to help people uh, kind of manage things in smaller chunks. So, oops. Okay, so we'll plan to vote on that next meeting. Thank you. Which is January. Yeah, but again, we'll be busy in January because yeah. we'll be looking at that budget, so. Well, hopefully oh, we'll goody. get a good look and we'll just be voting. <laughs> yeah, you. any questions, call me. Before. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer anything you want. Um, I'm easy to get, you know where I am. Email me, come mm -hmm. see me. Sometimes you're able to come yeah. before school, and, and that is fine. She's got a window in her door now, so I you know. can see if she's in there. Yeah, right. We want to bring in the school improvement plan next month, too. Cool, yeah, yeah. Um, that will, uh, that would be great, though. Um, come see me, call me, and, and I'd still probably like to talk to you anyway about, you know, the process and um, how that impacts what we're going to be doing. Okay, great. Good job. I make a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Okay. Four seconds. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. And it's about. I'm not going to ask the rec committee. If they I'm want not to buy saying 13. I'm saying 814. I think that.